Here is Scott Stelts, head coach, Chatham High School in New York, uh, ABCA A Tech uh, High School Division Three Coach of the Year, but over 25 years teaching, coaching, and AD, and then back-to-back state champs this year. So, Scotty, congrats. Thank you very much. It was quite, a, quite an experience. Yeah, and um, this is kind of round two. You know, I, it seemed like I was on a streak of Wi-Fi here, but I think we're through it. So you had to, to go to school, get away from the house. So we are, we are crystal clear right now, which is good. Good. Not bad being in school a couple of weeks before the kids anyway. So <laughs> Yeah, you know, and I asked earlier, you know, you hosted, you were a host family for the Albany Dutchman for a while. And then I asked you, like, what, what got you involved with that? And uh, so basically, it's, it's a kind of a long story, but I'll keep it short, was um, we, had, we had put into host well before we had uh, children, and they just didn't need it. It was just I'd, I'd had a host family in Virginia, and I, the only thing they ever asked, uh, I was an older couple, was that you pay it forward. And so I was excited to pay it forward, convinced my wife some, somewhat, and um, also now the blue, about five years after I'd put in for it, they called us with like two days before the season started, and... Uh, would you be interested? And I said, um, I don't think so. I probably would be, but we, we just had a daughter. Um, there's no way I can get this by my wife, you know, blah, blah, blah. And she said, well, I'm 10 minutes away. I'll, I'll swing by and check it out. And um, we didn't really even have a spot for them. We didn't have mattresses. And she said, we'll throw mattresses on the floor in the basement. And the first two kids we had showed up at our boy's fifth, fifth birthday party with about 75 people. And one of them, um, who is still with the Tigers, was rolling around in the driveway before he even got to the house with the kids. And my wife was sold from then on. And um, out of all the 10 years, we always had a great experience. So it was, it was a lot of fun, a lot, a lot of work at times, but it's a lot of fun. The kids, kids love it. The kids actually miss it this year. Yeah. So, I mean, it's just a very unique thing for, for college summer baseball. And the minor leagues still do it a little bit too, not as much anymore, but I just think it's neat for families to, to have college age baseball players around. I think it's great for the kids. It, it was it was wonderful. I think all the way around. Um, you know, your part time psychologist, part time parent, full time chef. Um, but yeah, I mean, the experience that we had and the kids had, and hopefully we gave them. We're still in contact with almost all of them. They're all doing well. Um, that's my wife's favorite part is hearing from them. We've been to some weddings. Looking forward to some more. So it's it's just an all around great experience. I mean, did you give them much many tips from the coaching side of things when you would watch them? Did you give them any tips? Um, I'm I'm more of a hands off guy. So I it, you know we'd build a relationship first, and then if they wanted some, I'd give them some. Um, but you got to figure they've got three to four coaches. They've got their parents who want to be still coaching them. They've got their college coaches. They, they've got enough voices. Um, we have a batting cage. So there were some guys where we'd spend some time out in the, in the cage hitting, um, especially if they were slumping, or we'd s- spend some time in the kitchen table at one in the morning if they were slumping. Um, but, you know, until I really started coaching the Dutchman, it was more just hands off, be, be the support staff and the maybe hopefully the father that was, you know, they didn't, they didn't have there to depend on. So uh, Who nudged you to start coaching the Dutchman? Uh, the head coach, Nick Davey, you know, I would just show up at the game. He knew I was hosting. We'd uh, played against each other, played together, um, and um, he had coached at a college. And the first year, he's like, oh, I'd love to get you out here, but the kids were young. And I was like, yeah, you know, not now. And then we hit a small window where they were young but not too deep into travel ball where we could squeeze it. And then my last year, I really missed a lot of their travel experience, and that's when I decided I, I had to step back, get back to coaching my guys. Yeah, and are you coach? You're coaching 15U also. Uh yeah. Well, I was a 14 14U this year. It'll be a 15U in the fall. Yeah. So, and then I help out with my daughter's team as well. So. Oh, good for you. How's it been yeah. coaching your kids? Uh, I'm sure you know, but it's a challenge. Um, it, it's a great experience, but there's definitely this is the first year. You know, they're they turned 15, um, and they're twins, so they're they're competitive with each other, um, and they don't want to disappoint me. Um, as the dad and the coach, you know, so it, it's it's definitely had a couple challenges here and there, but I wouldn't trade it for the world. I mean, there's no better. I mean, you know, you look at the dads that are outside the fence, and I'm lucky to be inside the fence, so it's awesome. Are you running those teams any different from your high school team? Not a ton, not a ton. Um, you know, the goal is to prepare them. In my world, travel ball is to prepare you for your high school experience and beyond. Um, so we run them the same, you know, this whole year, it's been all Chatham. It's been all my 
future players for the most part. So we're go, we're using the same plays, the same signs. Um, they get the, they get held the same accountability level, which is probably tough on them and sometimes too much for me. But you know, they will like a guy tell them all the time. You will know what is expected when you get here. So it's it's been it's been really fun. I mean, what are some of your accountability things for them? Uh, well, you know, like no, there's never any excuses. We always say excuses build the house of failure. Um, you know, be personally responsible. Obviously, your effort, your energy, um, be selfless. You know, the same thing as our high school standards. Um, be on time. We don't. We don't have. We have standards. We don't really have a lot of rules. You know, but we have a, a few standards that we just expect them to meet. And as a coach, I've learned to understand. You know, they're emotionally different than my varsity team. So they're trying to meet them, but they're they're new to the emotional game. So I've got to I've learned to step back and let them have their emotions and then talk them through it instead of attack, especially my sons, instead of attacking them for it. <laughs> I mean, what what are some of their their pitfalls? Um, I I think they my, my sons personally want to please me. Yeah. You know, they they're typical typical sons. They they want to they want to make their dad proud. It's a small town, so they I think they understand. There's extra pressure from that that they put on themselves, you know, and, and that they felt from the community going through their JV season this year. Um, you know, there's different expectations of, that ha- they they have on them. Um, so that's that's probably the biggest one. Um, and you know, when they get they get emotionally sideways, then they're not present. And if they're not present, you can't really be fully competitive. So just trying to bring them back full circle to where their feet are, you know. Are you giving lessons? I saw you're at the cage. Are you giving lessons? Yeah, I give, I give lessons down there, um, and then I have a cage in my house where I give lessons as well. I actually had a couple today. Um, that that to me is just fun. I love seeing the growth of another kid. Um, I've I've got some some future studs coming up through um, that I'm I'm lucky to work with. I got, I've got a couple girls that can swing it. Got a lot of softball girls as well. So that that keeps you grounded. Completely different emotionally, you know. Um, but they're so much more positive when they make a mistake for the most part. So that's good because I do have a plan of when my boys graduate, I'm going to go coach my daughter as long as she still wants me to, um, hopefully here for high school softball. So I'm trying to learn all, learn all the ins and outs of that side of it. I mean, what, yeah, what, what's been the difference with softball and baseball? The girls, the girls, um, they just, they're so energetic. They, they, there's no egos. There's literally no egos whatsoever, um, but when they get when they get emotional, it's a different animal. As I'm sure you know, it's just a different animal. But it, it's it's been it's been really fun um, just watching the girls um, that I work with grow, um, watching my daughter grow and her team. I'm kind of like their off season hitting coach, um, and that's enough for me because um, we butted heads for for a couple of years right away. She's just the youngest with two older brothers. And we're proud that she don't she don't let anybody um, you know beat her up mentally, but she's got a quick trigger too. So um, it's, that's been a challenge, but we're we're in a really good place right now with that. So yeah, a buddy of mine coaches at Power Five uh, softball school, but he started on the baseball side, and uh, he really really enjoys coaching college softball players. Same thing, no ego, yeah. said almost too coachable. Where he'll be working with a freshman, and he'll have an all American on the side that's trying to change because of what he's telling somebody else. And he's like, no, like you keep doing what you're doing. You yeah. don't need to, to switch. Like, you know, he said almost to a fault, they're, they're almost too coachable. That is, he nailed it. That is, that is the truth. If you're talking to one, they're all listening. Where in baseball, you're talking the other one. The other ones don't think it applies to them. So it's the complete opposite. I saw you manage the website for the athletic department. I used to. Yeah. I, how'd uh, you get into that? Was that just kind of forced on you? Yeah, well, when you're the athletic director at a small school, you wear every every hat except principal and vice principal. So, yeah, that was just part of the part of the gig. I, I mean, where'd you start with web design? I mean, we do a li- I do a little bit here. I know enough to to be dangerous. I'm not good at it. Uh, that's why we have people in the office that are really good at that, and I don't have to. But I do do it a little bit for the the podcast, where I'll I'll edit the the website for the podcast. But where did you yeah. dive in when first trying to? Oh, I, I have zero experience. That is all done by like. I'll make we. I used to make suggestions, but we have school people that actually handle all that. Thank heavens, or I would have never got home. <laughs> it also said you wrote the athletic code of conduct. 
Yeah, yeah. I did um, a while back. I just thought, you know, when I got here, um, I don't know how to put it nicely. We were very uncompetitive. Um, we were the excuse makers. We were, you know, for the most part, we were near the bottom in a lot of different sports other than some soccers. Um, and we just had to start and work from the ground up and rebuild it, and, um, bring in coaches that were committed to the process, committed to the kids, not just the winning. And eventually the culture changed, you know, got, got involved in the community programs, was fortunate. I had some really good parents when I first started that I could lean on in the community. And then as they came through the school, um, it really just transferred in. They already knew the expectations. I've been on the Little League board since I was 18, on or off, you know, helping out and assisting. So that was a good way to be involved in the community for me. And it's fun. I mean, what resources did you lean into when you're trying to write an athletic code of conduct? Well, I took, took the previous one and I literally went, you know, paragraph by paragraph thinking, does this apply to us? Is it working? Making changes, getting rid of some stuff, adding some stuff in. Um, I called around to some local colleges to get a glance at what they would do in that situation, you know, and just, just, just made it, tighten it up. Um, I, I also depend on my principal. He's a big sports guy. Um, so, you know, bounce everything off him. And that, that was a huge, he's always been a huge help all 20. He's going to, he's going to leave this year. Um, he's retiring. So that'll be a big loss for me and our school, but he's always just been a great resource for me. Do the athletes have to sign it? Yes. Yeah. And we, we, we held them accountable to it. That was, that was one of the best things that we started, um, was having them actually put their, their signature on it. Yeah. Yeah, it makes it real, right? It makes it real. And nowadays, you don't do that as much, so it probably even has more meaning. Yeah. You know, when we were growing up, you signed everything, you know? Yeah. Yep. But, yeah, definitely, definitely helped. And then the coaches holding them accountable, so it wasn't just me as the athletic director. Having the coaches hold them accountable um, was big, putting the right coaches in place. And then teaching the coaches, not teach them, but getting the ones that would work together instead of, you know, soccer versus football. Because in a small school – you know, there's only so many athletes, so everybody wants them. But learning to share them and support each other was a big, big thing. You know? I mean, how are, how are those conversations? Like, hey, we're all in this thing together, so, you know, you're going to have to split time with your athletes in a small school. Yeah. For, for the most part, um, really good. We, we, had some, we had some people in the beginning that only wanted them to play their sport year-round. But, you know, I tell all our, all our kids, like, you're a minimum of a two-sport athlete. Hopefully, you're a three-sport athlete. You want to be a four sport athlete, go ahead. But you're, you're only making yourself better. You're making your team better. And then you're making your community. You give them pride. You know, we're the cool thing about the probably the coolest thing about the small school setting is the community pride. When we when we went to our regionals and states the last two years, our streets are lined when we're leaving on the bus at 8 a.m. It's it's it, I mean, it makes me cry. I, I don't admit that I cry a lot. Brings tears to my eye, though. I my favorite scene was the teary, first year. I was thinking about it. <laughs> My uh, my bus drivers from growing up were running across the lawn, cheering for us to leave, and that I mean that gives my the hair on my arms is standing up right now. Like just seeing Mrs. O'Connor and Mrs. Neller, like on the streets, there's the oh brought me so much pride and just made me you know reflect on what a community we have. So you knew at 18 you're going to get into coaching then, huh? No, it was an accident. <laughs> um, I I was playing and I was work, I was working for a guy mowing lawns and um, he had a heart attack while we were mowing lawns and all of a sudden his mower just went by without him on it and we we're out in the country. I broke a window, called nine one one, and got him there. And as he was on a stretcher, he said, "You got to do two things. You got to get my truck with my mower home. You got to coach my little league team tonight." <laughs> So, you know, you're not going to say no to a guy like that, right? So I did, and it ended up being a few weeks. Then even when he could come back, he really couldn't be involved. He had to just sit and be calm. And I was having such a good time, I brought one of my buddies in, and that's kind of how I got hooked. It was just, you know, we took a team, the team of, you know, like the Bad News Bears, and kind of flipped them around a little bit and competed, and they had fun, and we had fun, and that was it. I mean, where, the, where was the first place you started with the little guys? Um, so that, that would have been the first, they were probably a eight, eight and nine year old team. Maybe, maybe there was some tens, but it was right in our local little league that I just kind of took over that team for that guy. And then the next year, like I went away to college and I got back and one of the uh, guys was like, Hey, 
come finish out the rest of the year with me. And from there on, like I was a good resource, you know, and I was playing college ball. So that didn't help or didn't hurt, um, you know, because, you know, kids will listen to the young guy. Yeah. You know, no matter what I say, they would have listened. But because I had a hat and I played, they don't. Li- and I've learned that with my kids. Like I've got my kids have a pitching lesson today. I can teach them pitching. But they'd rather hear it from somebody else right now. And as a as an adult and a father, you got to understand that's just the avenue you got to take sometimes. Yeah, I mean, how so, long did it take you to figure that piece out that you need to have your kids have other voices? Well, one of the guys who actually was my assistant back in early 2000s, um, I already started helping him with Little League. And day two, he's like, I'll tell you what, you coach my kids, I won't say another word. And he would tell me what to say, and they would – if I said jump over the fence, they jump over the fence, you know, and that just never, never left me. Like it's so much easier. And he was a great coach. They were great kids. They had a great relationship. It's just, you know, about 11, 12 till I don't know when it ends. Cause my boys are 15, but hopefully it ends soon. There's just, they, they don't want to disappoint you and they're going to do everything they can to, uh, to make it work. Maybe 20, my 20 year old is going <laughs> to figure things out. All right, <laughs> five more years. Got some time. My seventeen-year-old still hasn't figured it out yet, so that's okay. <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> what do you feel like's helping your your guys the most now at the high school level? Um, our culture, just our culture with the baseball program. I had some guys um that bought in. I honestly think COVID helped. <laughs> as weird as that sounds, um, losing a season I think made them appreciate it more. It made me appreciate it more. But I took the COVID year, and because my school decided to pay us, we couldn't coach. So I would send them quotes. I'd communicate with them. But every night I'd, I'd watch the – here's your ABCA plug. I'd watch the ABCA videos. I'd watch two videos a night and take notes, and I just made a playbook out of it. Um, and, the, the, if, I mean, you're involved so deeply with it, you know. But, I mean, without a culture, it don't matter what you say. It really doesn't matter what knowledge you have, what, what – training methods you have and I just took that to heart and got the guys to buy in and we were lucky we've had some really good leaders the last few years um and and teammates and it's just taken off I saw in one of your articles after the state championship you're, they said they all played little league together yeah so our town is that small where there was when they played there was probably four teams at their age group now there's two um and you know they've come right through the same school system um, they basically played, a, most of them played the same travel team growing up. Um, and then, you know, some branch off for higher levels and more challenges and stuff. But yeah, these guys have been friends. I mean, you could, if you call one of them, I guarantee two or three of them are right there by the other ones. Like it's a unique gr- group dynamic or team dynamic. So with your playbook, when are you introducing all of that? Is it bit by bit? Or are you trying to go over it all in the beginning or how are you handling the playbook with getting information to them? Yeah, we, we, we do it day by day. Like I, they don't, you know, a couple of them have a copy of the playbook, but for the most part, it's just, I just work through it. I structured it like how I would like, um, I don't know if you had a coach's checklist, you know, of things you need to do preseason, things you need to cover in season, et cetera. I just have it laid out like that. And I just work my way right through the, you know, right through the day. Some days you miss, some days you cover more than you need to. Um, some days, some years you can skip some stuff, but just, just, you know, chunk it off, knock a chunk off every day. Um, I mean, when we, we communicate very well, we have group chats. I'm sure everybody does, but we're sending quotes all year round. It just kind of sends the, the temperature of the room that we want, you know? I think it keeps them centered too. Yeah. And honestly, it, because they're two and three sport athletes, they, they transfer it and apply it to their other sports. And I think, you know, some of my guys have said that's been really helpful. You know, you're on the free throw line and you got a baseball quote in the back of your head that's helping. And I'll, I'll, I'll take ownership for that any day. That, if I can help them in the off season too, that's great. So, I mean, was that the strength of your team then this year? Was it just the culture piece and how tight they were? Yeah, our culture. Um, I mean, we we can swing it. Don't don't get me wrong. We have athletes. We can swing it. We can throw it. We we run like our tails on fire. Um, we we don't we don't we have a red light. That's the only sign we have on the bases. And I probably gave that twice, other than when the score was you know a big gap in the score, but. Um, you know, I had a kid, I had a kid that's going to Northeastern to hit 16 home runs this year. That's, that's a lot of home runs in a 20, 27 game season. Yeah. A lot you know, of those guys returning from last year's team too? 
I had, yeah, so I had seven seniors this year um, that returned next year. Next year will be a little more challenging, but we've, we've got a great core. Um, they're all working. Um, I like I like the underdog um, mantra anyway. I don't like, we, 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 we embraced the target on our back. We've made shirts with a target on our back this year um, just to embrace it because the kids were feeling the pressure. I think the coaches were hearing the pressure, like every time you went into a store, got to win again, you know, got to do it again. And guys, we lost, we lost some good guys. Like it's hard to do. We almost, we almost lost in the sectional game. We were, I think we were down to two outs trailing and my big guy, Jake Taylor shot one into right field and won the game. Um, I think have we only a had three luck, don't you, to win it? Yeah, that's what I always tell them. Like, it's, I, it. There is. Hey, that's my wife. Well, there's always a luck. Yeah, there's some magic. That, the teams that, that win a championship, there, there's some magic that, that happens that – the years that you don't win it, like you just don't get those same breaks that you do on the years. That exactly. You win. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, I think culture is a big part. You, you get them to buy in and believe in those situations, right? You got 15 kids that believe that that one guy is coming through yeah. versus the guy at plate hoping to come through. That's a big difference, yeah. especially over the course of the season. And then in the playoffs, when you're seeing consistently good pitching and competition, you know, it's much better to have everyone on board than to have a couple guys thinking, should I be abandoning ship here? Or like, we're not going to get this done, you know? So it's, I think having our leaders with us for so long, like they were like extra coaches. Like I could, I, I had four or five guys, maybe six. I, if I didn't show up to practice, practice would have got taken care of, you know? And my assistant coaches, I could, I could never show up and it'd be run right. I've been, I've been very former, I have a former player and then, Another assistant, Dan, who's been on and off with me for 15 years. He's been with the girls' programs when they won their state championship. So he knows how to win. Uh, his yeah, kid came through their program. That's right. Yeah, exactly. Winners they win. find ways. Yeah. I mean, how, how is he different than maybe some other coaches that you've been around? I mean, coaches that win do win, but they do things differently than, than coaches that aren't successful. And, you know, what are some things that he's doing differently maybe? Both my assistants hold the kids to the exact same standard – that I would, you know, like, and, and that's big. Like they can't go over to coach Doyle or coach Joe and get sympathy. Yeah. It's just not going to happen. They're going to, they might put their arm around them and give them a hug, but they're still going to say, no, you still got to, you got to figure out how to make that play, but, or you got to put the bat on the ball in that situation. So the accountability level really never changes. Um, and they, they know their role. They both, for the most part are the good cop. I'm the bad cop. And then they, they get to like, you know, they just lose it once or twice a year. And those are my favorite days because the kids can't believe that it's happening. And, and it's like, it, it just brings us right back to where we need to be headed. You know, they, they put them right back. Because as, as the head coach, you can only be hard on them so much. You know what I mean? Um, but when those guys do it, boy, it's, it's a wake-up call for the team. So that, that stuff, you know, that, that's part of it too. You know, one of the articles I read, you mentioned about being elite. How are you defining that to your players, what elite is? Um, being prepared every single day, being prepared to be the best teammate, right? We don't control if we can be the best player, but we can control whether we're the best teammate. If we have a team full of best teammates, you can win a lot of battles, right? If you're together, you, you can beat more skilled teams. You can beat faster teams, you, you know, so it's, it's just being, being competitive every single day with yourself. Be the best version of yourself, and then the rest will handle itself, you know. But too much, too many times, kids and teams get caught up in stats. Sometimes parents, you know, friends, family members, whatever. But we we talk about that a lot. Like just just be the best version of yourself. You don't have to be three for four. You can be zero for four and be the best teammate and have the best day possible, right? But you could also be zero for four and be a huge distraction, and that's what we can't have. Because then you pull down another guy, and all of a sudden we're, we're a sinking ship instead of just, you know, chugging along. Yeah, I love that quote that being great is boring. Yeah, it's, yeah, that's it. Yeah. It's the daily, do it every day. It's just those small things yep. you do every day. Being great's boring because you just, you do it, it show up, and you do it every day, and, and you stack all those days together. You're going to look up, it's going to be pretty good. But yeah, it's being great's boring. It's just yeah. it's just that daily exactly. process of, of getting after it. Well, we talk about process all the time. Process, culture, just re repeat your best day. Just keep doing that. Be the best version of yourself. 
I mean, with, with them keeping them accountable and staying on that, you feel like that helps them develop some resiliency. Absolutely. You know, at first you you can sense it. You know, as a coach, you can sense that they don't like it, right? But so that's where you got to. You know, I'm in school with them, so that's where the next morning I got to put my arm around them and tell them why we're doing. Hey, we're doing this to make you better. Isn't we don't not like you. We don't think you're incapable. If if I thought you're incapable, you wouldn't be getting the opportunity. Right. So understand when you're getting the opportunity, we believe that says right there, we believe in you. And I think that's the other thing is you have to remind these kids nowadays that you believe in them and you love them. Right. They really need to know you believe in them Um, because baseball is a hard game. But life's pretty hard right now, too, for kids. It's pretty challenging. The things they deal with that we didn't. (laughs) That's social media. How do you relay that to the parents, too? Because, I mean, that's a different model now than what you're seeing. Like, that's going to be different for some parents, too. Oh, there's no doubt that, um, you know, the parents, but the parents have always been really supportive of what we do. You know, I know they question it and they talk amongst each other, but that's where, um, you know, having some parents that have come up with me either through the travel ball or younger or different sport or just being friends because it's a small community. I feel like enough of the community always supports what we're doing where the, the other parents that are unsure, they just kind of buy in or at least they trust the process until they figure out, hey, he does have the best interest of my kid at heart, you know? And we, we have a meeting and we tell them, we coach you guys, we're going to coach your kids different than they've been coached, but we're going to coach them hard, but we're going to love them too. You know, like some some of my kids will tell me, you know, like some of my players will we'll, we'll end the day with, I love you. Like that's that's rare in today's society, Right. I but said it, it a lot you. more towards the end. I was, I, cause I did, I do love them. Yeah. You know, and yeah. I, I was saying, but I was like, if they don't hear it from me, then it's, it's not a thing. Like, right, and, then they don't and you know can it. Tell, right? Like the first time I told a kid, Hey, I love you. And you could see him like, what? I'm like, yeah, yeah. 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 It's not lip service. I do love you. Well, we had, we had a kid that was with us last year that I met during, um, during summer ball. He was our bat boy and he would show up all the time, just show up in the dugout, the game, be the bat boy. And, uh, he ended up developing a brain tumor, and um, we, we crossed paths last year. Our team played his team, and um, he wanted that bat. He was he was battling the cancer, and um, so we gave him the at-bat, and unfortunately my pitcher got so nervous that he walked him. <laughs> and then Evan talked some trash to him, <laughs> which was typical Evan, afraid, afraid to throw it to me, you know, blah, blah, blah. But from that moment on, he became a part of our team, um, and he went with us to every game. He would have a treatment on a Friday. And he'd be in our dugout Friday night. Um, his parents drove him to like all across the state to be at the games, and I'll probably start crying. But um, what that meant to us, um, Evan, Evan became like a friend to every one of us. He followed us through every sport. He went through our football season with us this fall, and then he he passed away in February. But his dad still shows up, and uh, his uncle, his mom, and Evan's still with us. Like he. Like all my players just still care about them. And I think that that also played a role. That's a, that's um, a growing up lesson, you know, um, and a really tough one. It was heartbreaking. Um, but I mean, how really... did you handle that? Like, you know, teams deal with tragedy sometimes. I mean, how did you handle that with your players? Like that a young kid, like you're not used to, that's not supposed to happen with a young kid. No. loss. So how do you handle that with your players? Like, hey, I'm sorry, this is part of the life journey. Like, it, life sucks sometimes. And yeah, Evan Evan handled it for us. Um, okay. He would always he would always tell you know, you you know, don't worry about me. Oh, you know, he'd make jokes about his cancer. He he would just make you forget about it. He'd make you feel good. I mean, and you know, he would tell me he loved me. I tell him I loved him. He'd tell some of our players. Um, he literally changed our lives, you know, um, and definitely mine. Um, still carry his picture everywhere I go. Um, but yeah, like I think our kids learned a lot. Um, like Evan was so, so strong and such a beautiful person through his adversity that none of our adversity ever seems significant anymore. And we always tell our kids, like we've said for years, adversity is our advantage, right? Because it gets you the opportunity to show what we're made of, what our culture is about. So if you use it that way, every time there's adversity, we're up one, right? And adversity hits in baseball sometimes two, three times an inning. So you can really outscore the team if you can handle adversity. And I think Evan was our probably our biggest life lesson in it, how to handle adversity. Um, he's just 
It was unbelievable. Never, never not smiling. Never, ever once. And it's just beautiful, beautiful to see. Sad that he's gone, but it just, I mean, what a guy. Love it. Love it. Hey, you mentioned with with summer ball for your guys, is that a benefit of being in a smaller community because there's not as many options for them for summer baseball? Well, there, yeah. I mean, I, I don't mind. I like having them with me, but I also like them branching out and getting to experience different coaching style, um, maybe a different area. Um, so there's some there's some really good academies around us where some of the guys play, some of them train. Um, and then they'll also get a lot of off-season reps in there. So, so it doesn't – either way, I'm fine with I do enjoy coaching them, but I also like when they branch out because then the next guy has to step up on our program. Hopefully, wherever they're going, they're asserting themselves and being a leader and a teammate. Um, so either way is fine by me. But we're, we're in a small town, but we're surrounded by, like, you know, cities and suburbs and stuff like that. So there's plenty of opportunities within a half hour. You're inside to start the year, correct? Yeah, yeah. I mean, how are you handling indoor practices? Um, you, that, well, once again, that's where that playbook kind of comes in. Like, so I have it written for indoor. What happened one year after COVID was we started like six weeks later. So it was written for indoor and we were outside the whole time. But I, I just try to do the little things better than everyone else while we're in there. You know, whether it's just fine tuning the mechanics, we throw a lot of bullpens, um, things that you can do inside. We don't get a lot of ground ball reps. We don't get to go over our defenses much, at least not at full size. We'll walk through. We'll watch videos. Um, we do a lot of motivational minute stuff, like where we give them a quote and they explain it. We give them baseball quizzes. Anything to just spur the mind and make them become a better baseball player and not get bored. You know, because it's are already you not your baseball quizzes. Um. We'll go by categories, like so. It'd be like a, it'd be an offensive day. Maybe we'll talk about maybe two rules, two strategies. You know, whether it's small ball, and then maybe we'll flip it around on the back half of it. Like usually, it's ten questions. There's teams of three or four, and then we'll talk about how would you defend it. You know, so they're they're getting both sides of it, and then we'll just jump different topics. Some days it's just fun, like could be history quizzes. You know, like home run leader, and the winner, you know, gets this or that. So. But the kids, they, they like that. They really, they dial in. I think they cheat sometimes with their phones. Um, but whatever, they're learning baseball. So, How much have you enjoyed the ABCA All-America Committee? Oh, my gosh. Other than that week leading up to coming to Omaha, <laughs> <laughs> that is the most stressful week of my life every I single year. every year. You guys have the oh hardest job. There's so many high school oh. players. And then now we're, we've been in the state I, championship I it, the last two years. Yeah, it's crazy. I say it every year. I'm like, this crew has the hardest job because oh. there are a lot of names to, to sift through. But I, I love it. I mean, the guys are great. Um, it, it's fun. They're, I don't know how aware you are, but during COVID, we were doing group chats. Like, we were, you know – getting together and talking different topics and you know you think you know a lot of baseball and it's played similar but completely different in a different part of the country and it just opened my eyes um but and then the trip to omaha <laughs> you can't you can't top for that. anybody that hasn't been i asked heath that too for anybody that hasn't been to omaha what would you tell them and about why they should go to omaha <laughs> if you like baseball you <laughs> and you don't go you, you you're not you're not really living I get my juice. <laughs> like that is just my that's baseball. I've been to World Series. Oh, yeah, my yeah. I've been to, like. I, I know, you know I'm biased. Things. I say it every year. It's the best sporting event we have of any sport. Like it's yeah. it's ten it's ten straight days of it. And I've never even been to a finals yet. Yeah. I mean, I'm, we're only there in the beginning, right? And I I'm one year. I'm staying for the whole week. I don't know what I'm going to tell my school, but because um, we're still in school. But I know I, I, I've got to stay. I've never asked, but I I would like to stay longer. But <laughs> I know we have other stuff that we have to to get going. Yeah, I know. But you know that experience. So oh, that community, like I think my boys have been with me three times now, and the last time I let them roam free. Like you, just the community of Omaha. It's like safe. It represents what America should be: the community. Yeah. And then you got the best baseball you can possibly get on top of it. I don't know, you can't beat it. And you I just think can't it, beat it. I think it makes you a better coach too, because I mean, you're in. You see how they handle high pressure environments. That, that's yeah. always been the thing that stuck out to me is watching how the head coaches handle that environment because it's it's high stress, and they all, for the most part, keep a pretty low pulse. 
And that's got to help you. Byproduct of that is helping you handle state championship environments is because you learn how you have to handle yeah. that environment. Well, the kids well, are already putting enough pressure on themselves. Yeah, you don't ever have to add any pressure. What I will say, I had a few years ago, I had a, we host a bunch of Louisville guys back to back to back years. And so three or four of them were out there playing. And my kids came and we got, you know, my kids were probably 11 or 12. So we went out. I mean, they had the time of their lives. And then one of the players I coached, his mom used to work for the NCAA. So she gave them a tour, the inside tour, you know, not the stadium tour where you're counting the toilets and the ba- and the trash cans, like the real thing. Oh, they still, we still, they still pull those videos up. Um, what an, what an experience out there. That's the best thing for me is I have a media pass, so I can walk Ugh. everywhere. So I am I spend a lot of time underneath trying to get out of the heat sometimes. But yeah. I usually dip down to the uh, the visitor's bullpen area because you can see the whole field from the visitor's bullpen area. So I'll dip down there yeah. usually in the beginning and, and watch from down there. It's just very fortunate that I, I get to do what I'm doing. Yeah, and like the thing you said about the stress, I mean, you definitely, the coaches are approachable. I'll never forget the first year I went, I think it was at Rosenblatt. I might not even been on the ABCA. I might have just been at the game. And it was Schlossnagel. So I I liked something about they were doing their infield outfield, and I just liked how the coaches were moving and kind of instructing them. So I was like, I'm going to shoot them an email. I shot them an email. They stayed for another week. They won it that year, and he replied to me on the flight home. And I was like, that's the difference between college baseball and the baseball fraternity and the other sports. Yeah. You just wouldn't get that. I mean, I'm Joe Nobody from Chatham, New York, and this guy's like, oh, I'll answer your question. Yeah, I'm celebrating. I'll just answer your question. I'll never forget it. And I, I saw him a couple years later out at the ABC and thanked him, and he kind of remembered it. And I was like, jeez. Yeah. You know? So it's, it's a cool fraternity to be, to be on the inside of, that's for sure. How did you end up at West Virginia Wesleyan? <laughs> so I was at Hudson Valley Community College, uh, which is local here in Troy. And I was going to go to Cortland, and they switched coaches. And the coach said, uh, hey, um, I'm just going to consider you a walk-on. Well, you know, when you're 20, your ego has something to say about that. So I was like, oh, well, forget that. So honestly, <laughs> we were when I was at Hudson Valley, we were at Delhi playing a doubleheader in the snow, and we went into the field house because we had a snow delay, and it was a cute girl from West Virginia with an accent, and I filled out the form. <laughs> and I never really thought I was going there. And at the end, of the, I said, All right, I'm not going to Cortland. Heck, with it, I'm going to try West Virginia Wesleyan. And, and so I called, and my girlfriend's mom at the time was an accountant, and she called, and she knew the ins and outs of financial aid, got me a ton of financial aid, and I was like, all right, I'm going. Makes sense financially, even if I don't play. And I'd never even visit the campus 11 hours away. I mean, that's a fairly mature thing. For, I mean, I've obviously, <laughs> the, maybe not the decision, but to yeah. be like, hey, I'm going 11 hours away from home, you know, not even seeing the place, such a huge leap of faith. Yeah, my dad my dad was supportive. He was a traveler, so he was like, good for you. Make a plan. Good luck. <laughs> Let me know when I need to come get you. <laughs> and I drove down there by myself, loaded the car up. It was, it was great. West Virginia is definitely a beautiful place. It's definitely a different place. It's different, but, um, it but I wouldn't trade it. I dri- I dri- yeah. I've driven through it West is Virginia a lot. It is and a beautiful the- state. People are so genuine down there. Um, yeah, it was a great, great experience. I wouldn't trade it. I mean, is that a little bit of a culture shock going from there yeah. from the Northeast? Yeah, you, you, you know, down here, up here, everyone's so fast paced. And I'll never forget, I went in the store to ask directions because you didn't have GPS. And uh, the guy was watching like a game on TV with his back to me. So I stood there for like three minutes and I was like, excuse me, sir. And he just put a finger up and he's like, when the commercial comes on. And I waited another two minutes. <laughs> and then he turned around, he was as polite as could be. And I'm thinking, like, wow. And then the second thing that hit me, I was walking across campus like the first or second week and everyone's like, hello. So I'm like, hi, hi. You know, from New York, you just keep your head down, you keep moving. And I thought the whole time there was someone behind me that knew everybody. <laughs> and I got to the door and I hold, held the door and there was no one behind me. And I was like, wow, these people are really nice. So those were my two moments. Do you have a fail forward moment? Do you have something you thought was going to sidetrack you? Uh, but looking back now is one of the best things that happened to you? Um... That's a good question. Not off the top of my head. 
I mean, I, I had a lot of a lot of adversity. I lost my mom young. Um, my dad passed about eight years ago. I'm an only child. Um, I think I was just fortunate enough where I had good people around me, whether it was um, friends, parents, girlfriends, parents that always always helped me, always looked out for me, the community. Um, you know, they always just kind of looked after me. Like I, I think everyone knew my play. I probably didn't understand it when I was younger. Um, and then I had some good, I was fortunate to have, um, some good role models, whether they were teachers or coaches. Um, and one of my girlfriend's fathers was super impactful on me. He took me on my college visits, you know, always checked in on me, even though I wasn't dating his daughter, you know, he just never had a son and always looked after me and, that's probably the guy that changed my life. But as far as fail forward, no, he just, I just had good guidance, good guidance. I mean, what is that about that? You know, we don't always get that, but you've seen the, the good side of humanity and people willing to, to pour into people that, that aren't family. Yeah. Um, that's why I do what I do. Honestly, what between my couple of my coaches and, and Mr. Ulsta and then another, you know, another, um, they just always kind of guided me and, you know, I always just, I don't know. I, I watched them from afar and studied them. And like you said, like they were just good humans. And that's what my dad always preached. Um, he was a great human, but it was just always give back. And I was going to be an accountant. And then, um, I did an internship and those people were miserable. They were just miserable. They had a lot of money, but they were miserable. And one of the guys like, make sure you do something you love. And, and I, I think I went back to school on Monday. I was like, I'm switching my major. And that was it, you know, and it was the right decision. You know, I don't, being a, being a teacher is what it is, but man, it's an honor to teach and make impact, have impacts on kids. Some of the most miserable really people is. I know are the ones that make the most money. Yes. Uh, and as you get older, you realize that. But when you're young and, you know, you're trying to be driven and be responsible and do everything else and make an impression, sometimes you fall into that trap. So, yeah, it's definitely, teaching is extremely rewarding. And coaching is just a better classroom than teaching. You know, baseball is your classroom. I think Augie Garrido said that, but yeah, I yeah, study no better, happiness better quite a bit. Class. So Lori Santos, she's a professor at Yale, and uh, she has some really good happiness stuff, and yeah. that that's a big one too. Like after a certain salary, it really doesn't matter how much money you make. Once all your needs huh. are met, you know, if you have a, a shelter and food and can pay extra a little bit here and there, but once you get to that point, like it doesn't matter after that. I'll look her up on the ride home. I'll She's listen great. to her on the ride yeah, home. Yeah, that's actually her uh, Her course RA class. It was a free class. I don't know if it's free anymore, um, but it was on hedonic adaptation. It was a, a six-week course, and this was probably the spring of 18, and I actually started doing this course online while we're on the bus. We had long bus rides at Western because we yeah. didn't fly anywhere, so I started doing this course on the bus, and... I got it done in like two weeks. It's really? Six week course. Yeah, it was easy though. Like a lot good videos, but it was all yeah. science backed. You know, showing gratitude. There were just some things that you know. It's, a lot of it I was doing, but there were some good nudges and some other directions, and it kind of recentered me as a human. Of like, okay, this is what's important. The yeah. external exactly. stuff really doesn't. You might make think it makes you happy. It, doesn't so it allowed me to I think it gives you a joy of, a lot of external things that's like okay i can't control that but it also helped me re-engage a little bit too where you be grateful for what you have like you know yeah, I th even I think, the things I think that aren't things, great like be grateful for that too so still an opportunity right yeah i think certain things give you joy but they don't extend into full happiness yes you know and learning the difference is is important you know i I'm going to look up this course, though. I think that's Yeah, Lori Santos, she's awesome. Uh, the Happiness do, Lab, um, is, her podcast is called The Happiness Lab. So We do, uh, we like our kids, they they write thank you letters on Fridays to, to people in their lives. You know, they thank their parents. And then right before we leave for our regionals, our players pick a teacher and give them their jersey. And they wear it until we're eliminated or whatever. So luckily, we haven't been eliminated the last few years. But I'll tell you, we had a, one of our best teachers two years ago, one of my, my first basemen gave her a jersey, and she wrote me this email that I read still. I, it's still saved on my computer. Like, it changed her whole year, you know, because coming out of COVID, you didn't connect with the kids. 
You couldn't see their facial expressions. She's like, I didn't even know this kid liked me. <laughs> you know, let alone I made this impact. And it completely changed her, you know, and she's still just, they are so, the teachers are so appreciative of that. But the kids learn to connect and what, a, what an impact just saying thank you means. Yeah, and they don't they see it them. like, you know, those emails, like kids don't see that. So they you need to show it to them like, hey, yeah, we'll read, we you read don't it right feel like them. it as a 15, 16, 17 year old. You can still make a huge impact. Well, the other thing is like most of the kids communicate with electronics, right? So thank you is just a text. So you don't get to see the facial expression or get the hug, yep. you know, so that's been that's been big trying to bring that back too. You know, connecting them back to each other and to the adults. So, do you have any routines? You got any evening or morning routines that are pretty consistent? Um, for you? I work. I work out three times a week usually with the boys. Um, you in the summer we come into the high school because it's it's pretty um, private, so there's not a lot of distractions. They're they're just getting into working out. Um, my daughter's starting to a little bit. Um, I read every every night. I sit on the couch and read, and then I'll. In the, in the winter, I'll watch a video, too, because it gets dark earlier. So I'll watch a baseball video. Could be one I've seen. Um, I listen to podcasts on the mower. I listen to podcasts when I'm driving. Sometimes I hate to admit, but I watch the podcast as well. Um, but I, I know, I think it was Sheets that called it Automobile University. Man, I, I live for that. Like, I don't really, I listen to music a little bit, but I love, I love the learning aspect of the podcast um, and just reading. I read a lot of biographies on, like, former leaders and stuff. Um, yeah, I listen to a lot more podcasts driving now than I, I ever have. You know, it, oh, it yeah. used to be all music, Yeah, but I definitely dive into more podcasts when I'm driving. I'm probably 80, probably 80, 20 now, like with the podcast. I mean, I've got, I've got a list of about 10 podcasts and I just cycle through right now. I'm back in, <laughs> back into the ABCA podcast from like 2015. I just restarted them. Love it. Um, Cause I got a lot of mowing. I got five hours of mowing every week. So, <laughs> I mow mine and my mother-in-law's, so um, that's, you know, but you learn something, it rejuvenates you, um, it focuses you instead of just mindlessly riding around, being bored, and then, you know, sometimes you just hear yourself spout out the stuff that you heard, you know, like you didn't even really realize you absorbed it, and I think that's that's awesome. I try to do it to my kids in the car, but they got their own set of headphones now, they're into music, so I got I to gotta let, it, let it slide for a while. <laughs> What are some final thoughts before I let you go? Man, join the ABCA would be my one thing. If, if you're a baseball coach, man, I, I, I used to go to conferences um, here in New Jersey, and they were great. They were fantastic. Um, but join the ABCA and everything that it offers. Like, you can get information at any time. You connect with – the coaches are so friendly and just build relationships. You know, And it's weird – like you might see them once a year at the conference, but you'll remember their face. They'll remember yours. You'll have a brief conversation. Um, that'd be that'd be my advice. If you're a baseball coach and you're serious, man, there's no better place to learn that I know of. I mean, YouTube's great, but there's the content that we have on the ABCA is it's unmatched. I, I just it's the one place you can connect to anybody. Like it's the one place, and I, you know. Yeah. For the $75 for me, like all the other resources are great, the videos and the, the insurance, just all of that. But I think it's it's more the community that you get pulled into once you're a member is you don't realize how many good people there are in the in the community. And once you get pulled in, it's like, okay, this is where I'm supposed to be. I found my tribe. Right. Exa yeah, exactly. You, you, you know you belong. You yes. know you belong. And, the, you know, the names and faces, the speakers change, but it's – it's always such good content. Yep. And then a month later when you forgot what they said because you got distracted or your buddy hit you or he's telling you how lady stayed out, you know, yep. you got the video to look at it, look at it again. So, I mean, the times that are had, I, I'm not a drinker at all, but the times we have are just, it's so fun. I look, yep. I've already, I already signed up for the hotel and everything already. I'm looking forward to it. Probably book my flight. I think my wife's going to come. Um, but yeah, Has I'm, she I'm been looking before? forward to it. No, she hasn't been just because uh, our kids are... Yeah, we had three hockey She'll know players, why so. after after those five days. She'll know why you want to go. Yeah, she's looking forward to it, I think. Yeah. You know, might be a little baseball overload, but she's she's she really enjoys the game now. She understands it. So sometimes too much. She asks me a lot of questions. <laughs> <laughs> but I enjoy it. Like, I enjoy explaining it. And watching her, like, love of the game just grow is really cool. So Love it. All right, Scotty, thanks for your time, man. I appreciate it. Hey, man, I love it. All right, I'll talk to her. I'll see you soon.